Thank you so much for having me. I'm Christine, and I run an online learning platform called Moon Learning, where I teach about UI design, Figma, and how to align all of that with code if you're a UI designer. And uh, it's pretty straightforward. Moon Learning, it's a, it's a subscription model. You sign in, and then you can just consume any of the pre-recorded courses or Figma files to your own liking. And what started off as a pet project has grown nicely, and by now, there are a few students across the globe. Before I dive in deeper, I'd like to give you a little overview of the Moon Learning headquarters, because as you'll see, they're quite impressive. So here we go. So um, you haven't seen anything yet. So because over here we have the recording studio, then we have our design team, we have our development team, sometimes they don't know what they're doing, and then we have post-production, client services, and we have accounting over here, as well as strategy and marketing. We also offer great perks like bring your family to work days more than you would ever ask for. And during pandemics, we also offer co-working with your spouses, whether you like it or not. So you might have guessed it, Moon Learning, it's, it's not some fancy big startup, it's just me on a very small little desk crammed in the corner of my home. And what started like this out of necessity, I capped it like this on purpose because I became a really big fan of keeping things really small and lean. Actually, I became as excited about this that I wrote an entire book about it called Solo, How to Build, Launch and Grow Your Own Digital Products. And this is really whether you code or you don't. Because if you think about it, we're getting quite used to this part here, the digital product part. The fast-moving um, new products that are coming, we're adapting to them. But what we talk very little about is this part, the on-your-own part. And I think this is a very interesting part. Because with this shift in technology, we're not only changing what we're building, but we can also fundamentally change how we're building these things. And I believe that this is going to open doors for all of us to create products and to run companies in very different ways that suit us. I found my happy place in something called solopreneurship, and to be honest, I didn't even know that existed before. And I believe that you can build... I'm um, sorry, I want to tell you a little bit about how I actually got there. Because I started off as a UI designer, and when companies and startups, when they booked me, then there was a design team and there was the development team. And a lot of the time, I found myself operating in this magic little area here, where both of them meet, also known as the area where designers and developers try really hard not to kill each other. And um, it's true, it's an area that's really full of problems all the time, but it's also an area that's full of solutions and of learning how each other's tools work and why these problems happen. So when the pandemic hit and I found myself with a little more free times on my hand than I would have wished for, I put these learnings into an online course. And what you see here, that's the, that's the thumbnail of the very first course I ever created. I put that course online, and with a few weeks, that went viral, and I could literally live off that one course. So about that, that never happened. And I'm really sorry to disappoint, because I know that's what you're here for. We're just making friends, you laughed at my jokes, so, you know, I feel obliged that I have to tell you the real story. Because what actually happened was this. Really small and steady, organic growth. It looks quite boring, but this is how it happened. But the more I put in there, the more I got out of it, but just very slowly. But I noticed that actually this area I was operating in was very interesting. Because if you think about it, as designers, we're always stuck in the middle. So if we know what's happening left and right of us, then we can really create much better products. But what also happened is that for the first time in my life, I got up in the morning and I was really, really excited about going to work, polishing this product and developing this product further. But what also happened is, as Moon Learning grew and people noticed this was no longer my side project, but there were substantial returns, they started asking me questions. And it was always the same questions. So are you going to hire people now? Are you going to turn this into a real company? And people started introducing me at events like this as a founder. And I had, and I have to, to be honest, I still do have very mixed feelings about that. On one hand, I'm like, I'm not a founder. I just like making these things on my small desk, and I'm happy if people enjoy them. On the other hand, I felt really flattered because it meant that people saw something bigger in it and something exciting, and I wanted to be like that. But 
the more I looked into that, all I saw, being a founder included apparently, was funding, growth, and the end goal, that was always the exit. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's absolutely fantastic. A lot of products, a lot of teams, that's what they need in order to thrive. But my product it didn't really need that. And to be honest, I don't think I'd be particularly good at that sort of setup anyways. But when people, when they noticed my hesitation around this, they meant well and they encouraged me. And they were like, just be a little louder. Just, just you know, be a little more bold, Christine. Just lean in and you can do it. And maybe... But what I didn't like about it was that when we're doing that, we're shining light on one way of building and one way of building only. And then we start molding ourselves to this idea. But just because you can make yourself fit in, it doesn't mean you're in the right place. And if you're not in the right place, you'll never fully thrive. Not you, not the product you're building, and definitely not that poor team that you're trying to lead. And I believe that we're losing out on a lot of fantastic ideas and great entrepreneurs by people ending up being played, stuck in the gutter, when they really don't have to. Because with this shift in technology, we can open up the spectrum. We're not losing out on anything, but we're just gaining new ways on building. In the end, it's about feeling that sense of agency, that independence to have control over your work and your career. I don't know what that happens for you on that spectrum. It's very different for all of us. But I can tell you a little bit where it happened for me. It's a quieter way of building. Maybe you call it a more humble way. But I think it's equally as relevant. Because I believe that you can build anything at this time and age if you reframe the picture in your mind, if you build the thing, and if you grow it. That sounds really simple, and for a lot of cases, it can be. So let's dive in a little. What does that mean? So the reframing. If you want to flip the script, then your head has to go with you. So what if we're building something that we enjoy making so much that gives us stable financial returns and that fits so well into our life that it scales with us and not away from us? Then I think suddenly you don't even want to sell this thing anymore. You want to keep it. And then suddenly, not funding, but time is your most important asset. Now, my days, they used to look like this. Anyone was able to jump into my calendar and just put a meeting. And again, meetings can be really great, but I'm a designer. I like making things. And I cannot make good quality products in these tiny little time slots that I was left with. So my days, they now look like this. I have no team. There is no overhead, no politics. There is no emails, no Slack channel. I literally just go back to building the whole day. And I finally returned to this joy of making that I believe that all of us really have inside, but I personally had forgotten about this for many years. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, it's not like it's a constant state of flow. Things go wrong, and they go wrong all the time. And you have to believe that you can figure them out. You have to jump in and find these solutions and just dig in and call that client service over and over again. There's not going to be an expert, there's not going to be the development team, no HR, you have to do it. And I believe that this place is actually the place where your confidence is built. It's like you're having a little proof of concept every day, over and over again, and you can grow in a really nice and healthy way, away from all the noise. If you're building like this, you don't have any money and you don't have any resources for market research and elaborate um, customer studies. You literally just build something, hit publish, and you see what happens. And that can be really scary. You have to go with the flow, I believe, is what they call it. And I tell you a little secret. The flow and me, we're, we're not really good friends. We actually we don't even like each other. So um, I thrive more in an environment of uh, compulsive overplanning, maybe with a sprinkle of anxiety on top. So this didn't come natural to me. And sometimes you just got to push it. When you're building this way, you also have to look at how you're going to earn from this, how you're going to live from this in a different angle. We're always told to look at revenue, but we cannot compare ourselves with a funded startup. What we're looking at as solopreneurs is the profit margin, and that can be really, really high, usually way above 90% for most solo ventures. That is because when you're building this way, 
you don't have funding, it's your money, you don't want another expensive hobby, so you're going to keep these costs really low. And then even though you just have this small and slight organic growth, it's going to be really worth your while. Here's an example, this is what it costs me to run Moon Learning a month, 324 euros. So building that way can actually make a lot of sense as well. Now if you like the idea, then you've got to build something. So how can we do that? Digital product, big word, could be anything, could be an app, could be a, a downloadable product, whatever you want it to be. I feel really strongly about one thing, which is own the core, own the heart and soul of your product. So what I mean by that, I see that all the time. People get a bit of money together, get an expert, usually a developer, to build that thing, then they take it back on to run it. And that can work, but it's quite tricky because you're giving away all of your power. You're giving away that speed and that knowledge, and you're always depending on someone else's time and resources. So if you know how to code, and you know, this is straightforward, you can build your own products. But even if you don't, you're living in a really great time. There are fantastic products on the market that can help you learn to code and move much faster and overcome hurdles you could not have overcome before. Now, again, I personally believe very strongly that you should own the course. So it's not about writing a prompt, getting something pretty and running it. I really believe that you should know what's under the hood. But these tools, they will be like your assistant helping you to do so. If you say, I really don't want to code, then you can use no-code solutions, and they're very good. The chance that someone already built a product for what you want to build is really high. Moon Learning, for example, the entire platform runs on a no-code solution. And a lot of the time, we frown a little bit upon this idea of a no-code. But I actually think, especially if you're not used to dealing with sensitive data, sometimes this is the better idea to run your products. And there's new products arising all the time. I actually think there's something wrong with my slides. Let's have a look. Ah, after this morning, none of you has an excuse anymore. So when you're building this way, you keep it simple because of the constraints. And that can be a good thing because you can be really fast. You throw it on the market, you have a new idea, you pivot overnight. Also, you're going to notice that when you start building something that are called satellite products are appearing, it's little features and things you, you didn't even think about that suddenly people become interested. And so you end up with like a little mini portfolio rather than just one product that you're running. Moon Learning happened to me that first I built Moon Learning, it's still my main product. Then people became really interested in why I don't hire and why it's just me, so I wrote solo. And while writing solo and researching all of these tools, I became really interested in going back into writing more code, and so currently I'm building pretty cheap houses, which is using image recognition to find affordable homes for renovation. So if you're having that mini portfolio, then how do we grow this without hiring more people? Now, the key to do so is that most of these products that you're running, they need to decouple time and money. And if you can do that, then you can automate things. Now, automation always sounds a bit mean, but what it really does is that we want to go back to this, to this whole day of building, that we have time to do what we want to do. Again, if you know how to code, that's going to be pretty straightforward. If you don't, then you can use tools like Zapier or any other tools. I personally use Zapier for almost everything. So I have a trigger, like student signs in, I set up all my automations, send a newsletter, sign in, um, send an invoice, whatever you want. It connects different APIs, and it just fulfills that task. So you don't need to code all of that in order to automate your business. Once you've done that, then you can use your AI tools to grow. Now, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable mentioning AI because the tools I'm going to show, some of you in the audience and some of my co-speakers have actually made them. So I want to be really clear what I'm talking about. When I was little, that was my favorite movie, Kid of the 80s. And I love this scene from today's point of view. When Marty McFly flies to the future, um, all the live communication in the future is run by fax machines because this is how we imagined the future in the 80s. So anything I show you is just another fax machine. I can show you cutting-edge things that you haven't heard about. Also, I'm not going to talk about any ethical concerns about this. All I'm going to show you is how I use these tools. And you'll see that it's pretty simple, but it makes a huge difference when you're just one. So the LLMs, again, seems way too obvious almost to just have that slide. I don't create any of my content with LLMs, but they add huge amounts of speed to my, uh, to my work. 
Another thing that you're going to do is, if you're building this way, then you're probably going to be operating in niche markets. And usually, there's other languages that you might not speak, or you might speak one of these languages and not feel comfortable in English. So what I do in order to offer me learning to a broader range of niche markets is I use AI to translate it. And the tricky part is not the translation, it's the keeping the sentence length actually the same, so it's aligning with the video. Plus, my voice, my personality, is a big part of the courses I want to keep. So um, here's the original snippet. Did you know that you can link Figma to a spreadsheet and not only pull in real information, but also swap components and instances? Let me show you. And then this is the AI-generated version in Spanish. ¿Sabías que puedes vincular Figma a una hoja de cálculo y no solo extraer información real, sino también intercambiar componentes e instancias? Deja que te lo enseñe. And by the way, you can do that with Figma. It's a YouTube video. I just want to have a quick shout out to Google Sheet Syncs, which is still one of my favorite plugins ever. A uh, last little example I want to show you. So I said I really want you to be very free when you're studying, um, but I don't know where you are. You might jump in in the middle, have forgotten about something. Plus, I have all of these other courses, articles, videos. So it's a little universe that I, Christine, created how I like to teach UI design. But in the courses, it's quite a linear experience. Um, and so I thought I could take the voice cloning and I could have a little chatbot that understands everything that I built before so you can ask questions because you're already hearing my voice. So this is a little mock-up of what this might look like. So it's important that we then use all these styles and variables in our components. What is a Figma component? A component is a reusable design element that can be used across multiple designs for easy updating. We covered this in video 4, minute 211. You might have missed it. Do you want me to play it again? And I also have a more detailed article about this topic you might like. So it's nothing you've never seen. It's a bit of chatbots, bits of translation and LLMs. But for me, building as one, this had made a huge difference. And I could not have done the same I do now five years ago. So if you're saying now, ah, oh, I like that. I want to have my own digital product, full-time, side project, whatever. But what on earth can I be building? There's usually two kinds of people. There's the ones that say, I have no idea at all. And then there's the other ones that say, my idea is so brilliant, I'm not even going to tell you because you're going to steal it. Now, for the brilliant ones amongst you, I have bad news. There are 8 billion people in this world, so the chances that someone already had your idea and already executed it is very high. And that's the good news for the uninspired ones amongst you. It doesn't matter. Just build anything and do it well. Get this idea out of your head that you're going to be the best. You don't even have the funding to be the best. I don't make the world's best Figma tutorials, because I think Molly Helmers is smiling at me from the first row, knowing she does. So think of it more like books. If you go into a store and you want to buy a book, then it's not like you go in there and you say, I want to have the world's best book. All of us would go in the store and end up with a different book, and that's really, really beautiful, and you have to see it like this. So build something well, and there is going to be an audience out there for you. The tricky part is finding that audience. And even if you do, it's the internet. So this is two reviews. I'm going to read them to you. Same day, screenshots didn't change anything. So the first one says, this is a well-organized course that is delivered in a professional manner. I feel confident to start designing in Figma now. Also, I must say the teacher has an incredibly soothing voice. Thank you. She's a great teacher, but she could also have a career doing voiceovers. Second one, this voice sounds fake, like an Alexa voice. It's very annoying. Also, the pacing of the lessons is very slow. If there's a bug, I fix it. If I got something wrong, I make it better. If with some people it resonates and they like it and others don't, I focus on the one that like my product and that I can work with. And I notice that works pretty well in life in general. So that was my story, my little ray of light. I hope you enjoyed it. As I said, I don't know where you are in all of this. Maybe you're already in your happy place. But if you ever feel like you're a plate stuck in the gutter and you have the chance to change your work, then please use it, because it's a privilege that not many of us are granted with. The generation before us, they needed a garage to do so. All you need is the cheapest desk from Ikea. <laughs> Thank you so much.